Good morning, everybody. Tom Christie back in the carving workshop this morning and working on a hen mallard. And today's video is going to be on hollowing a decoy. And it's a technique that uh, you don't have to use all of the time. It's kind of a basic technique, so maybe for you advanced carvers, you won't want to sit through this video. But I did want to show, uh, particularly beginning carvers, if you do need to hollow out your decoy, I'm going to show you how I do it. There are many ways to hollow a decoy and many materials that you use to fasten them back together. I'm not saying mine is the best way, I'm just going to show you what I do and hope that it ha that has value for your decoy carving. So we're going to take the body. Number one, why do you hollow a decoy? And when do you hollow de a decoy? If you're fortunate enough to get a piece of light wood and you've planned your pattern accordingly so that the draft is appropriate, the draft is the amount of the decoy under the water when it's in a flotation position, um, you don't have to hollow the decoy out. I like to hollow my competition decoys because they're judged on their flotation. And I personally think uh, I have a better shot at, at good flotation across a broad variety of uh, conditions with a very light body on the decoy and then the appropriate amount of, of weight in the keel that I put on the bottom. But there are differing opinions on that. Some people would say, yeah, but a heavier decoy is going to be less susceptible to wave push and chop push. I'm just telling you, I've had success with light decoys, that's why I hollow them out. So um, I want to show you that technique today. We're going to hollow it out by splitting it on the bandsaw very carefully. And I'll talk about why we need to be careful when you're splitting a decoy. I've carved this, uh, kind of rough carved it and rough sanded it to this point. So it's not finished sanded because um, once we split it, there's going to be some work to put it back together. And then I want to do the finish sanding to make sure the seam is hidden. And you're not going to see that once the decoy is painted. So we'll split it on the bandsaw. Then I use the drill press with Forstner bits, uh, a couple of different sizes. And we'll go through that and I'll demonstrate that for you to hollow out the, each half of the decoy and then put it back together with epoxy glue and hopefully do a good job of hiding the seam when we're done. And I'm gonna weigh the decoy before and after just to give you a feel for, well, how much weight are we talking about comes out of hollowing a decoy. Hey, uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please hit that subscribe button. That helps me build this thing so that it's available to a broad variety of people. It also uh, puts you on the list for any new content that I generate. You'll get notification of that so that you can check it out. But I appreciate it. Let's get started. All right, let's just get a quick weight on this decoy body before we start. And it looks like it's uh, one pound, 10 ounces. So that'll give us a frame of reference and just a, a comment before we go to the bandsaw. This is a pretty light piece of Tupelo to start with. And you can see a, a variety in uh, Tupelo weights depending on the growth rings, the amount of moisture in the wood, etc. But I like to start with as light as I can and then lighten it further by hollowing. All right, before we hit the bandsaw, I just want to do a little bit of planning. By the way, I have this uh, sophisticated carving jig called Block for Splitting Decoys. Save this. It's just an old piece of Tupelo uh, toward blade. So um, I'm an old guy, so I have to leave myself notes so I don't forget. But anyway, this is nice square with the blade, and that's important. And I always use a block like this as a guide block. I'm gonna keep pressure on the table as I'm moving the decoy through the bandsaw, and I'm gonna keep my decoy right against that block. If you don't use a block, 
it's dangerous in my opinion because you're free handing with no support and it's very easy for that blade to bind or to catch your decoy and start pulling or breaking a blade or worse. So for you beginners especially, but I think for us seasoned carvers as well, use a block like this and then keep pressure on the decoy on the block. I'm kind of sandwiching them together and then using the bottom of the block as my guide as I go through and split the decoy. One other thought, you got to kind of plan where do you want to split the decoy. I don't want it up in the carved area, of course, because that, that's going to be a problem. So I want it somewhere down in the main body of the decoy. And you'll see when I split a decoy, I'm not too concerned about a precise measurement. And normally I carve a little bit of a curvature or cut a curvature in the block because what that does when you get the halves back together it helps them nest together and we'll talk about that more. All right I'm going to keep both of my hands on either side one on the top of the decoy and one on the other side of the block and I'm pressing them together and pushing down on the block and then going very slow on this cut through the body of the decoy. Keeping my hands totally away from the, the bandsaw blade. It's really important you go slowly as you finish the cut as well. All right, we got the decoy safely split and now I'm just going to take a pencil and I use the my finger and kind of run around the edge of the decoy just to give myself a guideline you know we want to leave some wood and I normally leave about a half inch thickness at least I'm going to do that on both of these for bonding surface for the glue and so we don't get too close to the to the outside of the decoy or punch a hole in the decoy. All right. Now, I saved this piece of scrap when I bandsawed the bird out originally. And I do that for this purpose. It it becomes a great nesting fixture to hold your decoy in place. To keep your decoy nice and firm and square as we're hollowing out, because it matches all the surfaces and keeps things nice and flat. So keep that piece of scrap at least until you hollow out, and then you can toss that. Now I'm gonna use the Forstner drill to begin drilling holes around the perimeter. And then we'll use, uh, I'll use a one inch for that purpose. And then I'll move later to an inch and a half Forstner uh, to clear more wood out. Just a couple of safety items. These Forstner bits are, um, they really cut a lot of wood fast. So you need to be cautious. Number one, that we don't drill through the decoy when we're hollowing it out. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But number two, keep your hands away from that bit. I mean, those of you that are woodworkers know that. I just wanted to mention it here, especially for newer carvers. This is a powerful piece of equipment, so keep your fingers away from it as we're hollowing out the halves. Now, the question is, how do you not punch through the decoy, and I, believe me, I've done it before as you're hollowing out, especially since the geometry's changing here underneath. It really is kind of a gut feel and a line of sight thing. Um, experience helps. Just go slowly, I would recommend. And we're gonna start on the perimeter not try to dive too deep and then as we go towards the center of the decoy we can go deeper 
with our um, drilling to get down to the this area here. So I'm going to use my respirator while I do this. Um, this process generates a lot of dust, so I would recommend a, a mask or a respirator while you do it. And let's get started. So I'm going to start on that perimeter line we talk, like we talked about and follow that around. And you can see I'm only going maybe the depth of the Forstner bit on this first perimeter uh, drilling. But depending on your decoy, you just have to be careful and not go too deep. And I am going to speed the tape up so you can watch the process, but just know that it's I'm not really drilling this fast going forward. I'm going to go completely around the perimeter of the decoy like this. And again, uh, just about half inch deep, so we're not punching through that angle and it's good to clear the wood out like that periodically here in the back i can go a little deeper because the i know the decoy is deep there let's continue to work this around and then i'll move on to another the next step all right now we're back to normal drilling speed and i'm going to Start another row next to those, a little further in, and we can go deeper on this row around the perimeter. And again, just you have to keep an eye on how deep are you drilling so that we don't drill through the decoy. Just wanted to stop for a second so you can see I did the perimeter and you can't go too deep on that or you're going to start punching through. And then I go in a next row, move over. You can go much deeper on the second row around. And that's what we'll do next. We'll, and then you just have to use your fingers kind of as a pinch gauge to see how close you're getting to the, uh, to the outer side of the decoy. You wanna stay away from it, obviously, so we don't punch through. So I'll keep doing this. Then we'll take the center out. Then we can move to the larger Forstner and do some angles to take off more material. Okay, I'm speeding up the tape here again, just so you're aware of that, and going around this perimeter. And just kind of gauging depth as you go. Now I'm moving to that center section, going a little bit deeper again in this section. And just a note, uh, the Forstner can snag on to some of these pieces, especially as there's not much of the wood left, so be careful. All right, I did the first pass, kind of three passes with the one inch. Now I've put the inch and a half Forstner in. We're gonna angle the decoy and take off some of these this material in here uh, to smooth things out a little bit. This larger Forstner does have a tendency, especially as you're trying to um, peel off these steps that we've created, can kind of snag and jerk around. So keep your hands away like I'm doing here just in case it does snag and want to move the decoy a little bit, you don't have a, a thumb or a finger close to the Forstner. You know, flip the decoy around, working back in the tail area or the rear of the decoy here. Same process. Once you get those steps knocked off, then you can use the bigger Forstner bit to kind of go deeper and uh, go as deep as you need to, to leave about a half inch of material is what I target. Uh, but it's a little easier once the steps are out of the way and you can 
use this to cautiously peel away more wood. Okay, that's about as deep as I want to go, so just give you a quick look at, at the shape of things. Okay, now we've got the top hollowed out, and I want to do some hollowing on the bottom section. But I want to leave wood in the areas where the keel screws are going to come through, just to give them a, a surface to bite into. Uh, so I've got my keel here, and I know where the keel screws are going to go. So I'm just roughly positioning that on the bottom so I I know about where the material needs to be for my keel screws. And I'm going to leave that material alone as I'm hollowing out the lower section here. And we'll remove material around those pads. You can drill these out by hand, but this is one area where it's nice to have a drill press. I'm going to I want to leave about a half inch of material so we don't have to take too much out of this but I want to leave about a half inch bottom material in there for strength so I'm going to set my depth gauge at that point and that will make sure I don't go too deep. So be careful you don't drill through this undercut area and especially on the back here you have to be cautious and keep these pretty shallow. You can't go all the way down or you may risk drilling through there. So I'm just going to take a couple of shallow shots at that area. Then I can go down deeper, down to where I've set my stop. turn the sound off and speed up the the video here so you can just watch the progress again I'm being cautious in that front so we don't punch through the undercut area just working around the perimeter like we did in the top half and that's another area to be careful of that undercut area near the side pocket go deeper in the middle now I'm going to go back with the inch and a half Forstner just to clean up this center section. Off the sound again and just be careful, keep your fingers out of the way, particularly as you get to these areas where there's not much material left. The Forstner kind of wants to to snag those pieces of wood and it'll move the decoy around a little bit. Just a quick shot of both sections. Now let's see what kind of weight we have with the combined sections. It's like we're right at one pound now. So we took about 10 ounces of wood out. May not seem like a lot, but to me it makes a difference. Just another quick tip, if there's not enough material that you don't feel confident the keel screws are going to have enough to bite into, you can always glue on a little block inside and make sure there's plenty of material there for the screws. Like a hunting decoy, uh, I, might, I might do that with. This bird, I'm comfortable that this is going to give me enough biting power. And I also use... Uh, caulk to seal the screw holes so there's no leakage. Getting ready to epoxy the two halves together. And one thing I like to do, uh, if you have nothing to, to bite into, the, the halves can tend to slide around in the gluing process. So to, to avoid that, I just use some three quarter inch wire brads and tap them in Make sure you put them in far enough that you're not going to poke through the, the side. And then I use a side cutter 
to snip the heads off and leave enough of the brad sticking out that it's got something to bite into. And then put the halves together, get them lined up properly. If I can do that. And then push them down on those four posts. And that positively locates the top and the bottom. So during the gluing process, that really helps lock things in the right place. And I think it also adds a little strength in the bond between the two sections. All right, now I've got DevCon 5-Minute Epoxy, and I'm going to use a, an old paintbrush handle to spread that on each half quickly because this has a five minute set time and you'll get lots of thoughts and opinions on the type of adhesive you should use for various decoys and I respect that I just have used the DevCon for 35 years and it's for what I do it's been good uh, and I trust it if you're doing uh, marine decoys that are going to be soaking in the water for long, long periods of time, you may want to use something more in the marine adhesive area. But this is what I use for my competition decoys, which are going to be in tanks or out on the bay for you know hours and hours at a time, but they're not going to sit overnight in water. As long as I seal them up good, I haven't had a problem with the DevCon product. Again, you got to work really quick, and I like to spread it on both halves so I make sure I get good bonding seal on both halves of the decoy. This is when having the uh, locators in place helps speed-wise too. So now I'm gonna quickly put those halves together before the glue dries. Press them in place. And then I use electrician's tape just to put around both halves and pull some pressure on them. And then make sure you remove as much of the glue as possible quickly so you don't have to grind that off later. Make sure both halves are lined properly. Just another quick tip, you may not have this sophisticated device in your workshop, the Folgers can full of lead, but you need to use something to maintain pressure on the halves while the glue sets. And I'm sure there are better ways to do it. It's just what I've always done and it works. After the epoxy is set, then I use an old saber tooth burr bit, fine bit, the reason I use an old one is because this epoxy has a tendency to load up those burrs, so I don't want to use my best burrs for this job. But I'm just removing that excess glue from the outside and making sure uh, if there's any overlap or overhang of the two wood pieces that I blend those back together in good shape. And once that's done, I'll use the sanding drum to go back over and kind of blend things back together, take out any of the heavy grind marks, and just smooth things out. Then I'll use some 120 grit uh, sandpaper to just hand sand things and make sure th things are nice and round. And again, eliminating any tool marks that are left over and really smoothing that seam out to try to 
blend it together as much as possible. Looks pretty good. As a final touch, I like to wipe the seam down with acetone just to clean the wood around the seam and clean away any debris and then see if there are any spots that need a little additional attention. And if so, I'll use uh, Bondo body filler. Bondo is another two-part filler. So you mix the hardener in with the base material and make sure that is mixed up well. Now I'm just going to use a little piece of flexible plastic and uh, it's got a little curvature in it and I'm just going to apply this, I'll get a light over here so we can see better, pretty liberally over that seam area and feather it out on either side. So again, you may not have to do this. I just wanted to demonstrate it as kind of a final step if you have a seam that's giving you trouble and we don't want it showing up in the finished paint. Well, I think that's a wrap on hollowing out a decoy. I'm gonna let this Bondo dry before I sand it, but that's the final step just to smooth things out. You may not need to hollow out your decoys. If so, that's great. Um, it's less of work that way, but in today's video, I at least gave you an approach that I use to hollow out a decoy if you need to do it. Until next time, Tom Christie signing off. Good carving to all of you.